So this is on your handout here. Collision theory basically describes the minimum requirements that must be met for a chemical reaction to occur. And it's these three things. If molecules are going to react in a chemical reaction, the first thing that must happen is those molecules must collide. There must be a collision between those molecules. So but that's not enough. They've got to collide with the proper orientation. So let's pretend I'm a big, giant molecule. And here's the molecule I need to react with. And the way this reaction happens is it enters my mouth and I bite the cap off. That's this mock chemical reaction. And so here I'm set up to do it. But am I set up now if I turn around? No, there's not the proper orientation. The parts of the molecules that need to interact aren't going to collide in that orientation. So you've got to have the right orientation when the molecules collide as well. So, but even then, you've got to have sufficient energy. So I need a volunteer, and I'm going to pick on, I already know you, Nargis. You sat in the front row. I need you up here. I know, it's terrible. So what you guys don't know about Nargis is Nargis is a master in 17 different martial arts. She can kill everybody in this room with her pinky. So if we all ganged up on her, we'd all end up dead, just from her pinky. So here's the deal. We're going to do a mock chemical reaction. And I'm going to call this mock chemical reaction beating the crap out of Nargis. Sweet. So there's going to be a collision. You better believe it. Definitely going to be a collision. However, knowing her martial arts expertise, we have to have the proper orientation. It's called the sucker punch. Sweet. But even then, you know, if I give her a little kindergarten punch, right? then Nargis is going to turn around and beat the crap out of Chad. And I'm not really fond of that one. So I also got to hit her with sufficient energy. I got to knock her out. That way I have time enough to run away before she wakes up, right? Thanks, Nargis. So again, there's got to be a collision. It's got to have the correct orientation during the collision. And you got to have sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier in the reaction. So we often use collision theory to explain why most chemical reactions go faster at higher temperatures. What happens at the molecular level when we raise the temperature? So you get what? Why do you get more collisions, though? Because the molecules are moving more quickly on average. The average speed of the molecules goes up when you raise the temperature. And if they're moving faster, they're going to collide more often. And so the way we word this is we say that raising the temperature increases the collision frequency, or it increases how frequently the collisions occur. Okay. It turns out raising the temperature, though, is not going to do anything for you as far as the proper orientation. If one out of every 10 collisions at a lower temperature has the right orientation, then even at a higher temperature, only one out of every 10 collisions would have the right orientation. That doesn't change. But it will change this last one, because notice not only our molecules going to collide more frequently, but now that they're moving faster, when they collide, they're going to have more energy on average as well. And so we say that an increase in temperature increases the percentage of high energy collisions. And notice it's a percentage still. So do all molecules, let's say all the gas molecules in this room, are they all moving at the same speed? No. That's why we always talk, I'm careful to talk about average speeds. As you raise the temperature, the average speed goes up. But there's still some slower and some faster. So let's say that you guys, as normal college students, would be like a sample of a, you know, a set of reactants at low temperature. And the reaction we're going to do this time is not beating the crap out of Nargis. We're, we're done with that one. So we're going to do it. We're going to call this reaction getting eaten by the angry lions. So right behind this door right here, I have a whole army of angry lions that have been starved for the last four days. And I'm going to let them into the room. Here's the deal. If you can run a 4740, then you'll be fast enough to get out the door and not get eaten. 4740 is kind of like good high school athlete speed. Anybody run a 4740 that they know of? I bet there's a couple. So few years ago, I might have been able to, but I'm kind of old now. So, oh, I'm an Olympic athlete. I'll make it. That's right. Never mind. I'm out of here. You're all getting eaten. I'll make it. So, but very few of us are going to make it out. So, cool. All getting eaten by angry lions. So, let's say I raise the temperature. And so now, on average, we're going to have 
a big, you know, faster group of molecules here. Instead of us, we're going to bring and replace us. And analogous to this higher energy set of reactants, higher temperature, is going to be the Boston Celtics from last year. So last year's Boston Celtics, sweet. Going to bring them into the room. It's the Boston Celtics, a pro NBA team. What do you think about the likelihood of most of them getting out of the room before the Lions eat them? Yeah, most of them are going to get out of the room. I mean, Shaq is still going to die, but the rest of them are probably going to get out of the room. They can run faster than a 4740. Sweet. That's collision theory. The other way we go about demonstrating that uh, chemical reactions proceed more quickly at higher temperatures is through what's called the Arrhenius equation. This is on the second page of your handout, so in a text box. It's on the back page there. And it basically shows the relationship between the rate constant, lowercase k here, and the activation energy and the temperature. This constant out in front, A, is called the Arrhenius constant. It's just different for different chemical reactions. It has to do with you know, the molecules having the proper orientation and stuff like that during the collision. But it's a constant. It's for every different reaction, it's just a different constant. So, but the two things we can change, activation energy and temperature, this is the equation that shows the mathematical relationship. So how many of you guys speak a different language besides English? Cool. So math is a different language. It is not English. It's not Swahili. It's not French. It is its an entirely own language. How many of you guys speak math? So how many of you guys look at this and you're like, oh yeah, there it goes right through the, you know, the y-axis right there. Oh yeah, I can see this. Yeah, most of us don't speak math. And so mathematically, if you're an engineer or something like that and you can see this and see the relationship, awesome. For the rest of us, we're just going to look at this thing conceptually. So what should happen to the rate of the reaction as I raise the temperature? It should go faster. And ultimately, if you jack up the temperature, that ultimately will cause an increase in the rate constant value an increase in the rate constant value. So maybe I don't want a semicolon there, I don't know. But jack up the temperature, it jacks up the rate constant. And if you can mathematically see that, it's an exponential to a negative, great, awesome for you. But for the rest of us, conceptually, if you know it, great. So what about activation energy? What happens if you raise the activation energy barrier in a reaction? That's going to lower the rate because it lowers the rate constant. So I'll do it the other way around. If I lower the activation energy, that's going to increase the value of the rate constant. They're inversely proportional. How could you lower the activation energy? Add a catalyst. Sweet. All right. So if we look at, again, a typical rate law, if I increase the value of the rate constant k, then what will happen to the rate? It goes faster. They're definitely directly proportional here. They're definitely directly proportional. So Let's look at this. So again, how can I change the rate constant? How can I make it go higher based on what we just talked about? Raise the temperature. But if I raise the temperature, not only does it increase the k value, anything that increases the k value automatically also increases the rate. So increasing the temperature not only raises the rate constant k value, but also increases the rate. It does both. OK. How else can I increase the value of the rate constant? Lower the activation energy. And again, how would I do that? Adding a catalyst. But again, anything that changes k, that causes k to increase, like in this case, will also increase the rate. And so in this case, lowering the activation energy not only increases the rate constant, but increases the rate as well. Cool. Here's the deal. There's one more thing that will affect the rate that doesn't affect the rate constant. What is that one thing based on having a rate law right here? concentrations of your reactants. So typically, if you increase the concentrations of your reactants, well, if you increase A or B here in this case, depending on their orders, if, provided they're not zero order, it's going to increase the rate. Notice, do the reactant concentrations show up in the Arrhenius equation? Not at all. Cool. So you may get a question that just says, which of the following is 
true. So, and you know, about the rate constant of a reaction. It can be changed by this, yeah, that's true. It can be changed by the activation energy, yep, that's true. It can be changed by the reactant concentrations, that's not true. That affects the rate, but it does not affect the rate constant. So know that difference. All right, from the Arrhenius equation, we can actually extrapolate this lovely equation. It actually, you end up taking two sets of the Arrhenius equation and combining them. So and in this case, so you have two rate constants and two corresponding temperatures. So, and usually we give you everything you need in this equation except for one thing, and we ask you to solve for that one thing. So I'm not going to actually work an example, but I'm going to tell you the two things where students screw up. Temperatures have to be in units of what? Got to be Kelvin. So if K1 has to go with T1, K2 has to go with T2. So if I make T1 the higher temperature, then which K better be the larger K? K1. Higher temperature is going to have the larger K value. Lower temperature would have the lower K value. And actually, you could do it either way. You could make T1 the high temperature or the low temperature. It doesn't matter. Just make sure if you make him the high temperature, then K1 is the larger K value, and vice versa. The other thing is R. What is R? The gas constant. So in last semester with PV equals NRT, you guys got used to using a certain value of R. But we don't often use that one in this context here. So with the ideal gas law, we used like R equals 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And it makes sense. You know, we're talking about gases and units of liter atmospheres, you know, volume and pressure, great. Are we talking about gases right now? No. In fact, we're talking about energy. It's right next, right below activation energy. And so for these to divide through, they got to have the same units, it turns out. And so for units of energy, we usually use this guy for R, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So we will use the old value of R that you used last semester with Pivner once all semester. and It'll be in the next chapter. But for the rest of the semester, when we talk about R, besides that one place, we're usually talking about a context of energy, and you're going to be using this value. Both values are going to show up on the front of your exam. That's why I'm being sure you know which one to use. So here's the deal. We usually give you activation energy in units of kilojoules. And if R is in joules, you've got a problem. Either make them both kilojoules or make them both joules. It doesn't really matter which, but make your units match or you will get this calculation wrong. So make sure your temperatures are in Kelvin and make sure the units on EA, your activation energy, and the R value match, either joules or kilojoules, either way.